All right, thank you. Um, this is not really a rocket science talk. This is a how do we sort of grind through and get that thing we said we were going to do done talk. Um, I recently had uh, asked a team member to look at some of the Mount API conversions that were remaining because there'd been some kind of grumbling that things hadn't gotten done and things weren't moving. And it was an interesting sort of kernel janitor project to try to move forward and, and give that person some maybe some more experience. And then I started looking at it. Um, and then that kind of raised some questions. And then I talked to Amir and he said, sure, let's have that as a topic. So uh, I was just going to talk about three things today. It may not take all 30 minutes, and, and that's fine. Um, first of all, just sort of how far we've, we, we've gotten with all of these conversions, because the original goal was to do everything and then get rid of the internal API for the, for the old stuff. Um, and then going forward, um, I just had a couple questions about what we ought to be doing in terms of how we use the, the API message channel that's in, in the interface that um, is able to send specific info or error messages back out to whoever made the request. Um, and then in some of the patches that we sent just recently, I started some discussion about what we should do for unknown options at mount time, because some file systems tended to just ignore them, and other ones flat rejected them, and should we be consistent? And I think maybe the more interesting thing is on remount, most file systems honestly ignore most options on remount. Most, most options are not remountable. Um, so it's a little weird to say specifically, reconfigure this file system with this mount option, get success, and then have it ignored. So maybe, maybe we should switch that. Um, this is just kind of how things have gone over time. Um, version five was before any of this started, and then the blue line is things that have gotten done. Um, you know, there was a big surge. David got a lot done early on, and then things kind of waned. Um, and then when I asked uh, my uh, teammate Bill to, to start on some of these, and I sent a few, we actually have a little bit of um, little progress now, so we're, we're getting there. Um, I, I joked that it's going to take until 20, 26 to get done based on the current rate, but I think we can probably get done faster than that. Um, this is what's left. Actually, a bunch just got merged in this merge window just in the last 24 hours, which is great. Um, for ISOFS, NILFS2, and FAT, either there's patches out there on lists, or uh, for FAT, I have one in my tree that I just need to send. So. Don't go work on that one. Um, these are of varying complexity to get done. Some of them are going to be just absolutely trivial, and some of them are bcacheFS, um, <laughs> which I looked at and I thought, eh, I think Kent can do that one. Macros are awesome. <laughs> the macros are awesome. Um, F2FS was kind of weirdly difficult looking, but I can take another look at that. So, uh, you know, if you're the maintainer of any of these, um, you know, go for it. Um, you probably have a better notion of, of your existing test suite for mount options and things like that. Some of these are abandoned, so you know who knows. Um, you know, maybe it's a race to convert riserfs before it gets removed. Um, trying to think of any of the other these other ones. Finding images to be able to just test a basic mount on was kind of a, a trick. But if they're so abandoned that there's no user space and no image out there. Maybe you just do your best. Um, so this is the thing that I kind of had a question about. And I, I feel like we should be sort of consistent about this. There's, there are calls in the new API that let you send text strings back out to uh, the caller about you know, at, at different levels, right? info, warning, error. Um, some of those are sort of baked into the, the API infrastructure. And but file systems can just call that themselves as well. And when I first started looking at this, I thought, oh, yeah, we'll change these print Ks to, um, to these things. But then I kind of realized that's, that's probably not the right thing to do, because there's different audiences. Um, I can ask David what the original intent was, but um, you know, I'm imagining some of this stuff pops up in like a dialogue for the user. And yeah, well, answer that question first. <laughs> Not really. How about that? Yes. So the 
two, pur two main purposes for this channel. Firstly, when you're doing mount as, so when eventually we get in privileged mounts, you do mount from user space and it goes wrong. How do you find out what went wrong? You may not be able to get to D message, and in fact, Fedora as of 39, you can't get to D message unless you're granted permission. So the idea is, or is, or was, to pass this information back to the uh, the new mount through the new mount API. So user space could just print it on the command line, or whatever. The other purpose is so that the file system can ask questions, potentially like, pass, give me your password. And also, one of the things I want to do at some point with the new mount API is provide a supervisory process that can, say, run outside the container, run in, uh, super, uh, in uh, uh, privilege, some sort of privilege mode that can handle uh, parameterization, uh, permissions checking, so this can rule on whether you're not you're allowed to do that, so that we can just remove the supervisor check from as the, the root, uh, yeah, the, the root check from sysmount, so anybody can do it. The supervisor says yay or nay. And the supervisor can then send messages over this channel to the user space to be printed, say you're not allowed to do that because whatever. So that's the main use of it. So I think Christian's about to tell you that some of this is no longer necessary. But we still have auto mounts to deal with, though auto mounts can't use the message channel. But the supervis supervisory stuff. That you can. So if we uh, not. I don't know about Automount case uh, specifically, um, but the talk that Leonard gave last year uh, for unprivileged uh, mounting that already works now. So we have this sort of supervisor model, but it doesn't work by uh, by what you want. Is an and it would be single consumer. So you, it's like the cache file steam and you can only register as one consumer onto the uh, namespace. Okay, sorry, <clears throat> this is neither here nor there. Sorry, we should not distract from the actual uh, thing here. Um, okay, so um, Miracle Demon, fine. Just I want to say, it's not just fine Miro to the message, it's a must. You don't know if the version of util Linux We're going to print the message. Right. Uh, yeah. Um, I told Carol about this, and he now starts printing this, uh, yeah. printing this out. So this is already. Yeah. You don't know which V. I think he backported it to V 2.39. Doesn't matter. The kernel doesn't know yeah. if the user is going to see the message. Yeah. yeah. We should still probably print it to D message because yeah. it's helpful. Yeah. yeah. Yes. That's the. Well, I think there's two That's things. That's what I wanted to say, but we can't. So I once got yelled at, uh, I think from the, was some, did something in networking anyway, and I locked an info message where it, uh, it said something about uh, this attribute is uh, truncated or something. And I was made to redo this patch because printing unexpected stuff into D message apparently breaks user space API. So we would guard, need to guard this between a, a syscuddle, I guess. Or something. It, it kind of sounds like the first thing we want to add is some kind of versioning of the protocol. That's the first yeah. thing you want in network protocols. Uh, could we add that on and then version zero is util Linux that doesn't understand the what version am I? Uh, how do you want to expose that version? Yeah. Uh, well, the, no, the communications channel is bidirectional, isn't it? We have a bi-directional communications channel, don't we? I, I think part of the problem here is, correct me if I'm wrong, that there are random user space 
programs that are essentially scraping demessage, yes. right? They may be scraping it via Varlog messages, they may be scraping it via the serial console, uh, and the problem is there is no negotiation that happens, but if we change what we send out to demessage, there may be some random system administration scripts that get cranky, right? And, you know, they know about what existing file systems send out to demessage, um, and the fact that they are depending on varlog messages or demessage being a certain way is arguably their problem, but yeah. they're going to yell at us if we break them. <laughs> You were specifically talking about sending stuff to dmessage, yeah. and maybe we need yeah. to turn yeah. that off. So, right? so uh, the the mount API, how it currently works, it just locks into the struct fs context uh, or F fc log, I should say, and then uh, user space can use read to read the messages out, and then uh, user space can print it to you. Uh, uh, but we don't print any any of that to uh, to dmessage. What do we print the error to dmessage? I don't think any of it goes. Uh, error prints to both, but warning. Uh. <laughs> no, I'm pretty sure that if you if you set a mount option, uh, uh, if you set a mount option with FS config, and that mount option fails for whatever reason, and uh, it locks an info message, it doesn't appear in D message. Okay. It only you appears. Should, in, should it only appears in D message for error yeah. F. Yes, we can try that. I'm just warning yeah. that it's possible that user space will uh, yell at us because it suddenly sees messages uh, that it doesn't expect. So when I was, not concerned it should about always this, expect and expect. If, if we're not concerned about this, then we should probably just try it. Well, when I was thinking about this and writing the slides and talking to the doc, I kind of thought, you know, everything that goes to dmessage should probably remain it today. We probably shouldn't change those because it's, I mean, there's different permanence, right? I mean, if you send it to dmessage, that's in logs and it's useful for debugging and support and forensics oh. and all that kind of thing. Oh. Um, the other thing is like, you know, for example, if, I don't know why I'm feeding back. I'm sorry. I just remembered something, uh, uh, Ted, sorry. Uh, um, another reason is, <clears throat> and it's systemd's fault, uh, is that uh, um, systemd sometimes wants to know if a specific mount option is supported, right? You do this for procfs, and so they, they basically use a mount option that is called definitely not a valid mount option or something, and then probe, uh, uh, probe the kernel, is this mount option supported for lack of a better way of doing this? Right. And so if we would unconditionally enable printing to dmessage, if you boot up a systemd system or you start service, you would constantly see it's very spammy. Uh, invalid mount option, invalid mount option, invalid mount option, invalid yeah. The problem is, I think when you converted OverlayFS, OverlayFS had many error cases, but also a lot of fallback cases. Like they print a warning and ignore. Uh, I think you converted all those to prints that go to user space. I think. <laughs> and then, if user space doesn't print it, I think maybe the information is gone. So I'm not talking about whether any uh, uh, info should go to dmessage, but there should be a way to opt in to leave the dmessage in place. Yeah. For, we so, may need to convert some of the FS. Yeah, so uh, may I make a suggestion that we try to be a little bit more concrete here? I feel like we're boiling the ocean by talking very, very abstractly, right? Because I think we need to be very, very specific about this, what a invalid mount option, what log level should it go to in D message? Should it be in or an arrow? Let's define that. And it's going a little bit at reality is there is no protocol negotiation. People will do different things and you know existing software is existing software, we can't change it. Right? So I think, you know, when we say we can't log to dmessage, that may not be true. It's like dmessage at what log level, right? Because not everything gets printed if you send it at like debug, for example, right? So let's be a little bit more concrete. I feel like we're kind of spinning our wheels. Well, can, can I just follow up on that? I think none of them should report to dmessage because the file systems already have their own 
logging of mount error messages and so on to dmessage. XFS has its own, and it adds things like the XFS tag and the device number and stuff like that. We can't replace that at all with yeah. these uh, with these wrappers. So I think that these should just go to user space, and the file systems retain their existing logging to to dmessage and so on, and we don't change that. We keep this completely separate. From That's where I kind of land in. I agree that the end goal is send everything to user space, but I was trying to express a problem. OverlayFS, yeah, it wanted to communicate it. Not, not even an invalid option. Just, just know that this option was ignored, and there was no way to report this to user space, so it used the message, yeah. right? So right now there is a better option. We report to user space, but we have no idea if user space is going to print it or not. So, that's so right now, the message could be nowhere. <laughs> it, it kind of is user space, this problem. Yeah. Well, the first, to be, to be fair, uh, and then to get back on track, did, because of the lack of documentation and communication around it, the yeah. issue is that most people were like, you, you can read from that file descriptor? <laughs> it's basically the reaction every time I get when I tell them about it. That's what Derek said. <laughs> so, uh, uh, obvious questions first. How many of these file systems, we got a ton, how many of them have complex or mature uh, user space mount helpers? That's a good question, and I'm not sure. Yeah. NFS is one of the biggest culprits in this thing. It has got one of the biggest, most trickiest thing. It's got a big mount helper? It's got a very big mount helper tool? NFS? Yes. Yeah. yeah, okay. Because one of the things that, I mean, this is like deja vu for me, right? Because thinking back, you know, working on other operating systems, switching in 2002, 2003 to working on SMB stuff, Linux was like a disaster, right? The mount API, you couldn't, I needed to be able to tell user space things and all I had was these like 10 return codes that were valid, I mean, it's like, it was a disaster. How do I tell user space one of the thousands of different things, if, yeah, nothing's changed. So I, you know, my personal thing is, if there was a way to sort of interact sanely with the mount helper, whatever that looks like, and I know Leonard, you know, you have, you object to up calls, so there are probably better ways that you know of to, to interact between user space and kernel mount helper. But there's a thousand cases for NFS or SMB or, or Ceph or whatever, there's a thousand cases where you need to kind of return back to the user something. Now the, the related question is how many file systems have a sort of a interactive case where I tried to mount, I got back something, and it asks you a question. You know, maybe it's a password expired, maybe it's uh, the server moved, maybe it's you specified a mount option that makes no sense. Is there are cases of any mount helpers today where I mount, the server or local disk or something says something, and the mount helper is supposed to ask the user a question and try again? No, are there cases like that? Not that I know of. Yeah. Okay. Well, I, must, hmm? I mean, I mean, we yeah, I mean, I guess what I'm getting at is there, is there weird questions where, like, you've moved to ext4 for 610 kernel, and a mount option changed, change, ask. and they specified a mount option, and now it's done differently. There's no interactive. No, we equivalent, don't have right? that. I, th I mean, I, I think. <laughs> The way we deal with that is that's a user space ABI. We don't break user space ABIs. So um, there may be mount options that have become no ops, right? Or if I rename the mount option, I will continue to recognize the old one. I may print a warning message saying, you know, this is a no op mount option, but I'm not going to break you. So, but it's an informational message. I, I never ask the user to say, try again, use, you know, color without the U because I've decided to switch from British to American spelling and, and do that as an interactive thing. I, I don't know of any file system that does anything like that. Yeah. No, so, and, and I think we have more basic, uh, we have more basic problems than that when it comes to uh, different mount options, but you're probably going to talk about. Well, yeah, what I was going to wrap this up with is what I kind of landed at is that whatever goes out to user space should probably be uh, infrequent and um, 
brief, right? And, and, and I almost think it should just be a separate thing. Like, I mean, when XFS fails to mount because the, the super block is corrupted, it dumps out a hex dump, you know, to demessage so that you can analyze that later. I don't think that goes to user space. I think you tell user space, the file system corrupted can't mount. Um, and it's probably, you know, I mean, maybe we just need things in parallel and just be very intentional about this is something that user space should present to the user versus this is something that should be logged to demessage for posterity and analysis and all that kind of thing. And we, maybe we don't send them to the same place and we just say two different purposes, two different channels. I don't know. This is a great bike shed topic, I guess. I didn't quite realize it was going to be so uh, fascinating. <laughs> To, to Steve's point, about, I mean, I remember when Dave was working on this originally, and we talked about this on IRC a bunch at the time, and, and it was that, you know, really it comes down to the fact that, the, you know, an integer return is not expressive enough, yeah. you know, for, for amount, because you, there could be all sorts of problems. You needed to K in it, you needed to do this, you know, or your, your ticket expired, you know, that kind of stuff is really hard to express in, in an integer. So, you know, the, that was the rationale for p passing a string back, sure. because this allows the, the, the file system driver to say, I can send a, an explicit freeform string. And the other problem is sending it to D message not is that- Not a freeform string. Sorry? Not a freeform string. In bcacheFS, we've got an entire taxonomy of hierarchy of error codes. Oh, that's inc sure. incredibly helpful. But you have the capability to send back a freeform yeah. string. If we want to, we, we can have a standard about how it should look, you know, or whatever. But, but the, we have the capability yeah. to send that back now. The, the other problem is that with D message is that, you know, on some, on a busy box, you may be mounting and mounting stuff all the time. How do you know which message is yours, right? And so that's the other problem we've had with demessages in this kind of case. Past, you know, yeah. you, you, you might have a hundred of these things in there and you don't know which one is your problem. So. We have uh, we have prefix uh, the new mount API has prefixes where you can say uh, this is the for my subsystem essentially so that's a problem that's at least solved. The really annoying thing is it's a bit sad. It would be nice if it would be consistent across all file systems. To Dave's point, yes, absolutely. If you have your own thing already going on, we can't really change it. But how beautiful would it be? All messages, error messages from the VFS come with VFS colon. All messages that. Cashfs come with B Cashfs colon, and you could just like you know grab through D message and see what's going on. Uh, even better, what you can do when you can define a hierarchy like that, you can match on a specific part of the, of the hierarchy, and you can define error codes that are per call site. So your error code tells you exactly what error path is from. That's been a godsend for debugging. We kind of already do that with, with XFS. The stuff that we dump to uh, dmessage when we come across something like a file system corruption from a verifier actually dumps the, the, uh, the uh, fail address, we call it. It's basically the program counter at the point in time where the return is made. So we know what check actually failed. But that's more debug information right. for a developer. Um, you know, to be able to say, oh, we failed the super block, uh, block count is great, free block count is great, larger than the actual file system check. So that stuff we're dumping to D message, and that's not stuff that we ever want to be reporting directly to user right. space. So I don't think that's, you want to mirror everything. Yeah. So, I mean, the stuff that we'd report to user space in that situation is that the return message on mount would be essentially, you know, uh, file system corrupted, you know, a super block corrupted, um, please run, you know, un, you know, unmount and run repair. That's what we'd return to user space at that point. We wouldn't be returning that the detailed information that we already dumped to dmessage about the actual corruption, where it happened, the hex dump that goes along with it so we can see the structure that was actually corrupted um, and, and so on. So I think these things are uh, like I said earlier, they're completely set. They should be completely separate. One is aimed at being useful to users. Yeah. The other is basically what we've always done from a file system perspective to determine what actually went wrong during the mount. Um, so I agree with yeah, that. they're two separate things. Yes. Yeah. I actually found putting this stuff in the error code helps immensely with writing good er uh, log messages and error messages. Because one of the problems with logging good error messages is collecting the information from different places. The place where you generate the error is not the same as the place where you want to log the error because then you have the full context. 
if your error code encodes the exact type of error, it makes your log messages a lot better. So I was going to move on to the other, I mean, topics. Um, they're, they're not super fascinating either, but um, when I sent patches for TraceFS and DebugFS, which I sort of hoisted up from um, David's old Git tree, um, there was a comment still in there about how those two ignored unmount, or, uh, sorry, unknown options, and then that generated some discussion about should we have a strict mode where we explicitly, you know, regardless of what happened before, you can say, no, please be strict and tell me no if I've asked for something I can't have. Um, and so there's some talk about that. What I realized is that every single file system that's been converted has cargo culted this thing, which, like, if it finds an option that wasn't in the list, it will return an error. And um, NFS is the only one that does anything different. If it happened to find sloppy as a mount option first, then it, it won't worry about the other ones. Um, so, you know, kind of change slash broke debug FS and trace FS already because this now makes it ignore errors. I, I don't know that there's any point at this point to even worry about that. I mean, I think we've already sort of switched to strict mode with everything that's been converted. <laughs> Unless we're worried about those two file systems. Sure, I'm not saying it's, I mean. So like, SMB example, we see this all the time, right? I mean, Red Hat backports some fix. We don't know if this is rel 9 or rel 9.1, and the mount option was added in rel 9.1. Well, sloppy got complicated in the new mount API because you, it, now it's positional. If you don't send sloppy first, it doesn't know that it should yeah. ignore. Yeah, I mean, I, I agree that sloppy needs to be, it, it's complicated, but at the same time, it's incredibly common for any file system that has more than 20 mount options because you have absolutely no idea in those scripts that you do to set up the VM whether it's installed an update that adds a mount option. Yeah. Yeah, the other big problem is auto mount maps. Right. Sometimes, well, it was a bigger problem in the past because like, you know, we had Solaris boxes. We were, you know, people were administering it with the same auto mount maps as, as Linux, and that um, options didn't always match. So we had to deal with the fact that you might see a, a Solaris specific option in there, and, and that's what sloppy really was for. Maybe that's a reason to have a flag to say, I that this whole, it, I've opened this file system. Uh, just be sloppy. Don't. I, I, so. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, um, the issue is, I think, uh, because I'm at fault for, for at least one of the regressions, I think it must be due to overlay FS or some other conversion that I did. Uh, and I think Joseph might have copied that issue into ButterFS, but I don't know. Maybe, maybe I uh, uh, misremember that. Um, I thought if you switch to the new mount API, if you make you basically uh, make a conscious decision, and so it's okay to alter the behavior. But then I didn't, you know, think about oh, mount is going to convert to the new mount API, and obviously they just want things to work exactly the same. So for here is how I thought about it for the, for programmatic users like systemd, for example, I would expect you want to be informed about a mount not being possible uh, as early as possible. So if you set a mount option, you want to be informed about a mount option not being available uh, ASAP so that you can like adjust uh, your, um, your mount context or whatever. Um, and I still think that is useful, but uh, yeah, I think we need to provide a way to mirror the, uh, the old behavior where you like just ignore all unknown uh, mount options. And we have, uh, we have issues uh, for both remount and for mount itself. Yeah. I think for remount it's even worse. Yeah, I was going to say, I mean, most file systems will successfully parse anything that you give it that's a valid option and then ignore it and just not apply it. And it, I, I mean, do we care? I mean, would it, sh should we tell user space you can't remount that thing? Um, we never have. So, uh, my uh, intuition uh, here, again, my personal thinking about this, I was like, yeah, okay, if you want to, uh, if you go to remount uh, a file system and uh, it's a file system specific option that can in any way be uh, security sensitive, that you want to be uh, changed, or that would fundamentally alter the way the super block works, sometimes that exists, I can't think of an example right now, but uh, then you probably want to be informed about, hey, uh, this isn't this isn't possible, like the remount isn't possible with the options that you okay. uh, requested. Uh, but that's just not how 
it has worked forever. Um, and then I saw Fuse initiated this sort of behavior. Fuse has this behavior where they, uh, there is a, a mount option um, that gets initialized. Basically, we record when this comes from the new mount API, then we reject, it, uh, reject unknown options on uh, remount. Uh, and I copied that behavior, I think, into OverlayFS. Um, and the, the question is like semantically correct for me. It feels like if you request mount options, uh, have a mount option request that can't be satisfied, you want to yeah. report an error. Uh, but uh, it apparently breaks user space, especially stuff like uh, mount. So we need some way to express the desire either for the old behavior or uh, the new behavior. Okay. So, sorry. How does user space know which option wasn't supported? Well, you ask one at a time. Set, set this option, so, set that yeah, option, yeah, yeah. set this In option. the new mount API, the default would be in the new mount API, the, in the new mount API, um, you have functions like in ball FC, uh, for example, uh, and then you can say this mount option didn't work. Uh, didn't work. The problem is the following. Um, <laughs> If you have, uh, let's say you have a moderately complicated file system, and you have a bunch of mount options, uh, and uh, you set a mount option, that mount option works, and then you set a follow-up mount option, and basically you have a combination of mount right. options that together cause this to be rejected. So then you reject the last thing that actually caused it to happen, but you don't know the And then it becomes kind of order dependent. So and it's not really, that's not in itself really clean as well. I yeah. haven't come up with a good way to solve this problem. I mean, that's kind of related to what I was suggesting, is like we have this table of parameters, and we could have another thing that says, you know, this is never remountable, but there's some that might depend. Like, if you mounted with quota, you can turn enforcing on and off. But what, if you didn't mount with quota, what, you can't. What you need to do in your case is actually print or use invalid, with, uh, given error to say you can't use this with that. So I'm, I'm past my time, and we should let Christian uh, give his I, talk here soon. I was just going to say on that multiple one, with multiple options and the combination of them fails. Um, we kind of have that problem in user space with like MakeFS and, and MakeFS XFS. We have a table of all of the options that are, you know, can, are valid. The table also has the valid range of the values in them. And it also has a, uh, an array in it that says, this, this is incompatible with this command, this command option, this command option, and so on. And so when we're parsing them, um, you know, if, we, if the first you know, option gets set and then we parse a second option that then comes along and says that's incompatible, it will flag up and say you can't use these two options together. Um, and so to make that work properly, uh, each of the commands that conflict define the other command or the other set of commands that conflict with it. So it doesn't matter which one comes first, um, it will always report you know, that these two things or these three things conflict and that's the, the, the reason. But that then becomes a fairly complex data structure to be able to do that because it's, a, you know, it's a, essentially an unbound problem for real. Um, problem to actually enumerate all of those things. Um, and I don't see that being something that's, it, it's a corner case on a corner case for most file systems, and I don't think it's worth the complexity to try and solve that problem in the kernel. As long as we tell people that, you know, this, this mount option failed, or this is the one that failed, then they can go back and look at the man page or something like that and, so, and realize that, oh, it failed because I also had this one set and I had this one set. Um, so I think that we probably don't need that sort of complexity in doing this. Just say, this one failed, and leave it up to the user space to do the smart thing and look at the man page to explain it. And ext 4 does the same thing, it's ad hoc. I, I did actually put this in my initial implementation of uh, the Mount API, but Al decided he didn't like it and took it out. <laughs> I mean, I, I would quickly like to say as well that this kind of information passing that in all detail to user space, like what conflict was what, 
no user space really wants to read that. So the perfect is the enemy of the good. Just uh, tell us if it didn't work and give us a hint. Um, and if user space wants to then react to that and try a different combination, then user space can implement this. But they have to consciously implement that anyway. So giving them so much information, nobody right. wants this. Just yeah. don't. I mean, this is not a new problem, right? Like every co command line tool in the world um, uh, has to deal with the fact that certain combinations of switches are not supported. You're not new in this regard, right? Sure. So don't make it too complicated. Just, I think the current thing is actually fine. Yeah. Right. I'm going to hand it over to Christian. Yeah. Thank you.